Good evening. Good evening. Welcome as we come together this evening on Monday, Thursday to celebrate and remember the Last Supper of Jesus the Christ. For those of you who are viewing us online, we thank you for welcoming us into your home. Just a couple of announcements. Tomorrow at 12 noon, we will gather with our sisters and brothers at Fuel Faith United Evangelical Lutheran Church here in Nescapec for a tenebrae service, so please join us. On Sunday at 6.30, we'll begin Resurrection Sunday with a sunrise service and Holy Communion, followed by Easter Breakfast Coffee Fellowship at 7.30, and then 10 30 the traditional easter worship also with holy communion following tonight's benediction please remain standing for the postlude and then we will depart in silence let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we quietly reflect on the prelude. <laughs>
open the call to worship. We gather with the dirt of the day on our hands, our feet, and our hearts. We come in need of a Savior. We gather with the disciples preparing to come to the table, yet surprised once again by Jesus. We come with our expectations, only to be astonished by love. We gather at the basin to be washed and at the table to be fed in body and in spirit. We come seeking the grace to love one another as Christ loves us. Let us pray. Holy God, remind us on this special day of the many ways we know you as strong deliverer, as humble servant, as the one who bids us love one another, that the world might know you. Lead us not only to the beauty of solitary reflection, but also to community, as we remember together your words and your example. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us continue our worship with the opening hymn number 286, O Sacred Head Now Wounded.
We recognize in ourselves the strengths and weaknesses of Jesus' first disciples. Although they loved him, they disappointed him and failed him. And yet, gathering with these imperfect friends at his last meal, Jesus washed their feet in service and then extended the bread and cup to each. Jesus called them to love one another, invited them to share in his very life and in his acceptance of the road ahead. We are humbled, honored, and inspired by the deep love Christ extended to the world, and we take seriously the calling to be the body of Christ today. Forgive us when we disappoint and fail you, and guide us back to a place of trust and joyful living. Let us take a moment in silence for personal confession. According to the perfect and compassionate will of God, your sins are forgiven through the precious blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Will you join me in the prayer of illumination? Let us pray together, saying, Merciful God and Heavenly Father, since you have given your word to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, grant us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that by it we may be prepared for every good word and work, to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture passage this evening comes from Jeremiah 31. 31 to 34, hear these words. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And from the Gospel of Matthew, verses, chapter 26, verses 17 to 28. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve disciples. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes it is, as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And from verses 45 to 50. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Now the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Look, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you're here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the inspiration of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are seasons in the life of the church when the subject of the sermon is not in question. However, what is, is the passage of scripture that the pastor will choose as the focus for that message. I've shared with you on many occasions that when I am facing my sermon, 
On an account that is found in the Gospels, I will read all of the accounts before making my decision as to which one to use. Most often it's based on the wording and description that the Gospel writer uses. Well, this evening is no different. I preached on the Last Supper on many occasions, in fact, I think probably about 15 or 20 years worth, and have chosen just as often different accounts. So this evening, we will be exploring the passage from the Gospel of Matthew as we consider the idea of betrayal and traitors. Philadelphia, July 4th, 1776. The setting is Independence Hall, where the Second Continental Congress is meeting. The Declaration of Independence is adopted, and in so doing, the 13 American colonies sever their political connections to Great Britain, an act that Britain considers the ultimate betrayal. It is treason. Later, when the delegates got around to signing the Declaration, Benjamin Franklin realized the enormity of the situation. So putting aside his quill, he said to the assembly, and I quote, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately, end quote. Franklin did not hang, but very soon after, a 21-year-old boy did. His name was Nathan Hale. And his last words reportedly were this, and I quote, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country, end quote. He was hanged by the British in New York City as a small crowd gathered to observe near the southern end of where Central Park stands today. What is less well known is that some colonists were executed by George Washington or other officers of the Continental Army for being traitors. Have you ever heard the name David Farnsworth? For example, who was caught producing counterfeit money, creating a threat to the economy. Or Moses Dunbar, a loyalist executed for attempting to recruit for the British Army. The theme that pops up in today's lengthy test, however, is betrayal, which leads to some thinking about infamous traitors and backstabbers. Many were political spies and in the United States. The list would include Benedict Arnold and Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and many others. In history, the betrayal of Julius Caesar by his friend Brutus is still shocking to students of history. Since the theme of betrayal is such a human one, it is not surprising that literature is replete with classic betrayers. One of the dirtiest double-crossers is Iago from Othello. In the Count of Monte Cristo, Ferdinand Mondego falsely accuses his best friend Edmund of treason before having him in prison for 14 years. But that's not the worst of it. He also steals Edmund's fiance and marries her. This list of villains, backstabbers, and betrayers could continue. But to this short list, we add Judas, Peter, and Pilate, the three that are mentioned in Matthew's Gospel. What can we learn from these three? We need to understand that the betrayal of Judas was a deliberate, premeditated, and conscious act, taken by a deceiver, corrupted by greed, and motivated by ambition. Of the three betrayals, it was the most personal and mean-spirited. He was the mole, if you will, in the whole operation. His very name is associated with treachery and betrayal. A Judas kiss is any traitorous action disguised as a show of affection. A Judas is a treacherous, lying, thieving lowlife. A Judas tree is the name given to the alder tree from which Judas hanged himself. And I don't know about you, but I had no idea. You know the little peephole in your door? 
You either have it on your front door, it might be in a hotel room, you know what it's called? A Judas bowl. I never knew that. Would it surprise you to know that the name Judas is not now, nor has it ever been a popular name in a baby book? Jude, perhaps, but not Judas. In fact, the Beatles had a very popular song called Hey Jude, not Judas. Jesus knew, of course. He knew that there was a mole in the organization, a leak, that would lead to the temporary collapse of his ministry. Jesus once said, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Judas' betrayal was motivated by greed. He was always driven by the bottom line. If you remember his reaction to Mary's use of an expensive perfume with which she bathed the feet of Jesus. You see, he became the treasurer. He was in charge of what funds the disciples shared, and he stole from the purse often. The betrayal is personal. Judas arrives, and with him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. The enemies of Jesus came at night and met Jesus with overwhelming force. And when Judas greeted him, he leaned into him, clasping Jesus by his shoulders and kissed him on the cheek. This was personal, very, very personal. There was an anger motivated certainly and chiefly by greed, but no doubt also by disappointment and disillusionment. Jesus wasn't what Judas thought he would be. Nevertheless, the betrayal was stunning in its conception and diabolical in its execution. You cannot get more personal than a kiss. And it was the kiss that signaled, signaled the arrest and put plans to execute Jesus into high gear. The second disciple to betray Jesus was someone in his inner circle. Yet while Judas committed suicide, Peter would recover and become a passionate preacher in the formative early days of the church. It was Peter who, more than any other disciple, brought his Jewish brothers and sisters into the church. Peter's betrayal took place on the dark night of Jesus' interrogation before Annas the high priest, assisted by his son-in-law Caiaphas, also a high priest. It is unlikely that Peter had ever in his life been on the wrong side of the law, although there were times that his temper got him into some trouble, he was fine in his own natural environment, out in a boat on the Sea of Galilee catching fish. He was a simple fisherman. But on the night Jesus was questioned, Peter was hanging in there, warming his hands by a small fire. He remembered what the Lord had said to him only hours earlier. Truly, I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter had vehemently protested, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And in Peter's defense, the other disciples all said the same thing. We're with you, Jesus. We got gotcha. you. Remember when Jesus asked the disciples who people, people said he was, Peter spoke up, spoke up. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But Peter had never been tried by fire. 
When push came to shove, Peter's courage dis disintegrated. If we were to look at verse 17, after Peter responded to Jesus, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. No, we would never think of Peter as the rock when we look at his behavior while warming himself at that fire. His courage evaporated like the smoke. His first denial came following the observation of a servant girl who said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. He got up from the fire and moved out to the porch. There he ran into a second servant girl who, ignoring Peter, said to the crowd, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. This time Peter swore, adding, I do not know the man. His second betrayal. The third occurred after some people in the crowd came up to Peter and noted, certainly you are also one of them for your accent betrays you. At this, Peter became furious. And the Bible says that he cursed and swore, I do not know that man. Period. I never met him. I know nothing about him and have nothing to do with him. And then that rooster started crowing. And Peter ran out through the crowd and wept bitterly. This is where chapter 26 of Matthew's gospel ends. It's, it's as if he is too embarrassed for Peter's sake to follow him into the night. But then we have Pilate. Pilate's behavior was indeed a betrayal because he could have put an end to the proceedings of this travesty of a trial if he wanted to. But he too was a spineless coward and his political position was shaky at best. He loved his job and he betrayed Jesus so as to not jeopardize his position. The Bible says that when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, he literally washed his hands before the crowd and passed the buck. I am innocent of this man's blood. Truth is, Pilate seldom did anything. As political leaders went, he was small and insignificant in the Roman Empire. He had a cozy position that required that he do very little. As a minion to the powers that be and his villa, and his lifestyle were about all he cared about. The sooner this riot was over, the better. Sometimes it's not convenient to stand up for Jesus and every virtue, value, teaching, and truth he stood for. It certainly was not politically correct for Pilate to grow a spine, put on his big boy pants, and stand up for the truth and for what is good, right, and fair. Instead, he asked the one question that secured his place in the annals of history. What is truth, he said to Jesus. Whatever he thought the truth was, it was an inconvenient truth. And Pilate thus goes down in history as a man who, when he had a great opportunity, completely mishandled it. And then, sisters and brothers, there is you and me. So why do we betray Jesus? It could be that our motives for running away from Jesus are similar to these three, greed, cowardice, political correctness. Yet it is also likely, even after five weeks of Lenten introspection and evaluation, that we do not believe we have or that we would betray our faith. Rather, this Monday, Thursday, we will declare with Peter, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. Judas ultimately regretted what he did, so much so that he took his own life. Peter cried, and Pilate, I'm not sure if he regretted his actions or even had a second thought about what he did. 
In just a few minutes, you and I will gather to remember Jesus' sacrifice by sharing in the elements of Holy Communion. But is betrayal in our blood? Do we betray Jesus when, he, when we keep our faith hidden, only bringing it out on Sunday? Do we hide our light under a basket? Do our neighbors or friends even know we are Christians? Or do our actions deny that we even know him? As you and I continue our observance of Holy Week, let us pray that in our daily lives we will remain faithful and true witnesses of our resurrected Lord. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion as you turn to page 13 in your hymn. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave us grace as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we turned aside from you and your way and abused your gifts, you gave us him, your crowning gift. Emptying himself that our joy might be full, he fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take heat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to, to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Sisters and brothers, because there is one loaf, we who are many 
are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Will you stand as you're able as we join in the closing hymn, number 297, Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
God's evil said. Amen.